All right. This is the mop-up for August 21st, 2023. Thank you for being here. Life-threatening floods and mudslides in Mexico and Southern California as Hurricane Hillary has come barreling through. Rainfall records have been set throughout Los Angeles. Somewhat good news is that Hillary has weakened to a Category 1 storm, but 10 inches of rain are expected by Monday night. More than 50 years after America landed a man on the moon, Russia's unmanned Luna 25 crashed into the surface of the moon over the weekend. Maybe they should spend more time pulling out of Ukraine. Ecuador is picking a new president just weeks after one of its leading candidates was assassinated. I'll have more on those election results for tomorrow's show. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a genius. I wish we could all be like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie Taylor Greene on Fox News Sunday warned Donald Trump will be indicted next in Arizona for attempting to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Green says she's uncovered a massive conspiracy on the federal, state, and local level to steal the 2024 presidential election through our courts. And who's behind this massive conspiracy? According to Marjorie Taylor Green, the communists. The communists. Wow, she's smart. I wish we could all be like Marjorie Taylor Green. The communists. When MAGA supporters like her talk about making America great again, they mean, you know, going back to the 50s when only white people had it good. So as long as Marjorie's stuck in the 50s, she's bringing back the red menace. The communists. Ah, a golden oldie. Does anybody know any communists? I know some Marxists, but does anybody actually know a, a communist? You know, I would give anything if one communist ran an American union, one, or found their way into Congress. One communist, one. Here's the thing about Marjorie Taylor Greene. She thinks Republicans are as stupid as she is, and they are. Here is Arizona State Attorney General Chris Mays, who was elected last November, right? Marjorie Taylor Greene says the communists are coming for Donald Trump and the next indictment will be coming out of Arizona. And their new state attorney general, Chris Mays, is going going to indict him. So this is Arizona State Attorney General Chris Mays. She was elected last November. She was a Republican until Trump became president. She couldn't take it anymore. So in 2019, she gave up being a Republican and became a communist. I'm sorry, a Democrat. I'm sorry. Uh, here is Democrat, new, newly, newly elected Democrat, new Democrat, Arizona State Attorney General Chris Mays talking about her communist plot to steal the election from Donald Trump in 2024. We are uh, investigating the fake electors um, uh, situation. Um, And I understand why folks want to know uh, what is happening in our investigation. Uh, That's a natural desire given what just happened in Georgia and in Michigan. Uh, But we are doing a thorough and professional investigation. um, And we're going to do it on our timetable as justice uh, demands. See what's happening? She would have been, Chris Mays, would have been a formidable Republican. But Marjorie Taylor Greene's brain queefs stunk up the joint And instead, she converted and became a Democrat. Nobody good is left in the Republican Party. This is important. Up until 2019, Chris Mays was a Republican and someone you might actually consider voting for. I wouldn't, but she she had her credentials. She's, first of all, a lesbian, 
a celebrated journalist, an accomplished journalist, a graduate of the Columbia School of Public Administration. She became a reporter for the Arizona Republic, then went to law school, and it took until 2019 for her to say enough, and she joined the Democratic Party because of pubic lice chewing away at America's groin like Marjorie Taylor Greene. It is the imbeciles who drive everyone out. That's what my father used to tell me. The bad drives out the good. He always told me that. By the way, that just doesn't happen to political parties. It also happens to countries. People leave. They give up. They check out. They stop fighting for their party and then for their nation, especially the really smart ones. When you ask most politicians why they left the Republican Party after Trump took office, they will say they feared for their lives. So they got out early. They saw the warning signs and they got out of the party. It happens in countries as well. In 1930, Albert Einstein was asked what he thought of the Nazis who had not yet taken power. Einstein said, quote, I do not enjoy Herr Hitler's acquaintance. He is living on the empty stomach of Germany. Wow. He is living on the empty stomach of Germany. As soon as economic conditions improve, he will no longer be important. Well, he got that wrong, right? In 1930, Albert Einstein got that wrong. But in 1933, Hitler took power and Einstein was out the door. He came to America because Einstein was a genius. He saw things before the rest of us can. And others began to leave Germany until it was too late. The Republican Party, it's turning into a cult of personality. It's hanging on. Let me tell you something about Chris Christie. Bad guy. And I don't trust his motivations. But I don't even trust my motivations. So let's give him a little credit for the time being. Here is somebody. There is somebody in the Republican Party willing to stand up to Donald Trump. He deserves credit for this. Lindsey Graham who ran against Trump in 2016. Lindsey Graham called Donald Trump a jackass, a kook, a race-baiting bigot, and the most flawed nominee in the history of the Republican Party. And now Donald Trump can't get Lindsey off his lap. So give Chris Christie some credit. It happens to countries not just political parties. And it's beginning to happen here in America, slowly, gradually, I have hope. But the rich have left. The rich have left America. They, you know, they still vote here. They still donate. They still have their citizenship, but they're not really here. The billionaire class checked out long ago. Physically, where are they? They're, you know, on their yachts, in the south of France right now. A good part of the year, the billionaires, they're not here in America. And psychologically, they checked out years ago. Thanks to globalism, the billionaires can be anywhere. But you, me, we're stuck here. So look at the Republican Party. Nobody's left. Chris Christie, you know, couple, couple. But... Basically, this is, this is gone. This party is gone. And this happens to nations. It's, it's what happened in Germany, Syria, Russia, when Putin took over. The good people with the resources and a place to harbor them get up and go. And eventually, all that's left behind is this, Marjorie Taylor Greene. You know, it's very important to remind stupid people who are dangerous that they're stupid and dangerous. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is stupid and dangerous, and you have to pay attention to Marjorie Taylor Greene. She's a joke. Trump's a joke. 
Marjorie Taylor Greene is one of the most powerful jokes in Congress. She made a deal with Kevin McCarthy, the speaker. Marjorie Taylor Greene is stupid. She's bigoted and dangerous. She's an authoritarian Christian and a fascist. She's laughable. So was Hitler. So was Mussolini. So was Trump. Listen to what Marjorie Taylor Green is saying, because she is on the cutting edge of Republican politics. And I'm not joking around when I say that. Listen to what she's parroting. She is speaking the latest talking points from the NRA, the oil companies, the Christian authoritarians, and the billionaire class, because she's a fool. So she gets the talking points first. Listen to her. If you want to know where the Republican Party is heading or where the people in charge of it want it to head, pay attention to what this moron is parroting. She needs to be reminded that she's stupid and dangerous. So tell her she's stupid and dangerous. Do it through a postcard, please. Don't make her staff open letters. They can't be trusted with sharp objects like a letter opener. So just, you know, get a postcard. Here's your mailing address. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, 403 Cannon Building. That would be C-A-N-N-O-N. 403 Cannon Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. That would be Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, 403 Cannon Building, C-A-N-N-O-N Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. And send her a postcard. Send her a short note and let her know she's stupid. Now, here's how you do it. We have a small audience here, so let's have fun. Don't come across as a, a smart ass. Nobody likes a smart ass. Look at me, case in point. Act stupid. Tell her you're a member of the NRA. Tell her you're a devout Christian. Tell her you're a devout Orthodox Jew. Say you want America to be a Christian nation. Say the country is being overrun by communists. we got to stop the migrants at the border. Everybody should have an AR-15, and Joe Biden runs a criminal family. But Marjorie, you are stupid. And miss, you know, misspell some things. It's a postcard. Keep it short. But make sure th she thinks you're just as stupid as she is. It will really creep her out. If you try to outwit her... That doesn't register. Don't tell her you're a Democrat. Tell her you're a Republican. Tell her you're MAGA. Tell her you, you want the government to stay out of Medicare. Be as stupid as she is, but then tell her she's stupid. Tell her she's the devil. Tell her you are a devout Christian or you're, you're an Orthodox Jew. Tell her, you know, I voted for Trump, but you're the devil. Uh, she won't read anything. Well, hopefully she can read a little, but uh, her people, they don't want to hear from people like me. They want to hear from really ignor ignorant people. So uh, it only hurts and scares Marjorie if these postcards come from an ignoramus. And then at the end, tell her you're a devout Christian, and every night you pay for, you pray to Jesus that she has permanent rectal itch. You know, just one little line like that. Just let her think she's as stupid. You're as stupid as she is. Keep it short. Send her a postcard. Don't tell her off. Don't tell her what you really think. This is really important. We're a small little show. Let's have a little fun. Write postcards to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Her address is Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. And you don't need to spell Greene properly. I won't tell you how to spell Greene. 403 Cannon Building, C-A-N-N-O-N -N -N Building, 
Washington, D.C., 20515. Send a postcard. Keep it short. Pretend you're as stupid as she is, but then, then say something at the very end. I'm praying that you have a permanent yeast infection in your bladder. Something at the end. It won't stop anything from happening, I promise you, but you'll feel, em- you'll, uh, feel empowered. Uh, Again, nobody in the GOP is interested in how smart you are. They're interested in how dumb you are. As I said on yesterday's show, you catch more flies with shit than you do with honey. Uh, So it's foolish trying to outwit a stupid, crazy person. You can't have fun instead. A postcard costs 48 cents to mail. By 30 postcards, this is my 30-day plan for your happiness. It will work, I promise you, or your money back. By, go out and buy 30 postcards and 30 stamps. And every day you're angry, send a postcard to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Do it every day for the next month. And pretend you're stupid and then tell her she's stupid. Tell her you're praying to Jesus that she has swollen arches. Uh, But make sure she thinks you're just as stupid as she is. I promise you, in 30 days, your skin and nails will look healthier. Your hair will be vibrant. You'll be regular and easier to be around. Parties go insane. Countries go insane. Why shouldn't we... (laughs) Start sending these postcards. I'm telling you, it's good for your mental health. Uh, you got to go down fighting, not violently. You know how to be stupid with a pen. Write stupid postcards. Don't show off. Prove to yourself how stupid you can be. The Republicans have gone insane. They are very dangerous. Throughout history, going back to ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the Old Testament, citizens check out when their country goes insane. And uh, including the managerial class, they always check out. They devise an exit strategy. It's already happening here in America. They fake concern and then add, you know, Democrats are just as bad. See, they, they give themselves, uh, they, they, leave themselves uh, they leave themselves off the hook, right? Democrats is, are just as bad, so what can I do? Uh, let's just wait so this all sorts itself out. But it doesn't sort itself out unless you stand up for your republic peacefully with your pen. This is about democracy. This is... This is about democracy. Now, we're a republic, I know. But you either believe in democracy, people voting, having a say in self-determination, or you don't. This isn't about love of country, patriotism, or American exceptionalism. This is about democracy. Do you believe in counting every vote? Do you believe in more, not less, more democracy? See, the problem with liberals, the problem with the left, the problem with rich people, the problem with highly educated members of the professional managerial class is too many of them think they're smart. And because they think they're smart, they think they're smarter than others, and so they really don't trust democracy. They think there are more important issues than democracy. This is a problem. They don't think giving everyone the vote is essential. And so, in the end, they're not so worried about stolen elections. I have friends who, you know, voted for Biden and even wanted Bernie, and they go, eh, you know what? They're more important. Let it go. It was almost three years ago. We need to address income inequality. Well, you're not going to address income inequality if you allow fascists to steal elections. This is a serious problem with our side. Uh, A lot of my friends, a lot of my allies are more interested in proving that they're smarter than everybody than 
democracy. You know, and the professional managerial class, the older baby boomers, you know, they claim their heart is in the right place and they were upset by January 6th. But they follow the bond markets. They put their kids in private school, make sure the playing field is anything but level. And they convince themselves that the promise of America is that anyone can make it here. That's what I hear. The promise of America is that anyone can make it here. You know, the Obamas believe that crap. They, they, they believe it's all about having a chance to make it. But the promise of America to me isn't multi-million dollar book deals or production companies that you own that have deals with Netflix and Spotify. Spotify. That's uh, Mike Pence's streaming service, Spotify. The promise of America to me and I think to our founding fathers, as bad as they were, the promise of America is that everyone can vote. So even the people who don't make it, they get to participate too. Even the D students who drop out of high school for whatever reason, mom died, divorce. We don't know why people drop out and get Ds. But this is their country just as much as it's Jeff Bezos. Their vote is worth no less than mine. And I mean that. I do. Do you? Do you? Do you think the Clintons or the Obamas believe the people who don't own property on Martha's Vineyard should have just as equal a say in the affairs of government? as those who do own property on Martha's Vineyard. There is this un-American paternalism of meritocracy that seems to have emerged when everyone came home from World War II and decided college is the only answer. Not fixing toilets, not becoming a plumber, not doing real work, college. Go to college. Don't learn how to fix a car. Don't learn how to farm. Don't learn how to clean up after yourself. College. College. And they took over the Democratic Party. And that's why Republicans are able to run against the Democratic Party as elitists. Uh, they came home from World War II, said the, the GI Bill, everybody gets to go to college. Well, we saw how that worked out for America, haven't we? So what is your story of America? What do you believe in? I have a story of America that I believe in. That's why I find January 6th and Donald Trump's attempts to steal the election so un-American, so dangerous. To me... America isn't the story of people who came here with nothing and became rich. I don't want to hear that story. It's not The Blind Side, the movie, the odious movie, The Blind Side, which I hated when it came out. How paternalistic was The Blind Side, where a rich white couple adopts a troubled black child and turns him into a football star, and then they keep all his money. That's what it's turned out to be. They kept all his money. How, how could anybody... I remember seeing that movie and thinking, how can you not see the, the racism, the paternalism in this movie? This is... That movie was one of the most paternalistic, faux meritocracy, racist pieces of bullshit since Birth of a Nation. Well, it wasn't that bad. But uh, it was pretty bad. Uh, the message was the only, that only a kid who can play football is worth saving. That movie was pure exploitation, The Blind Side. We're learning more about it now. And uh, it celebrated exploitation. 
And this is how we're manipulated. This is at least how white people are manipulated. We're trained to sell it, you know, get a tear in our eye about this white couple that adopted a troubled black kid only because he could play football. And that's the message. That's their story of America. Not mine. My, my story of America isn't if you work hard, you can make it. That's not my story. Horatio Alger, pedophile. You know, the story of uh, picking yourself up by your bootstraps and making it. Look up Horatio Alger. You know, that whole American dream story. Pedophile. Horatio Alger, pedophile. Uh, but that's what they train us to believe, that if you don't make it, it's your fault. That was what Horatio Alger instilled. If you don't work hard, it's your fault. He was a pedophile. Uh, suppose I don't want to work hard. I should starve on the streets? Apparently so. Apparently so. I've asked this question to many people, including Democrats. Apparently so. I see a different story for America. I see a story of atoning for our past. I think we're born, countries are born in sin, and it is their obligation to atone for the past. You repair the past. You identify your origin story and its sins. You atone for them and make it better. So one of my stories, there are many stories that I tell about my country. One of the stories I tell is the story of a country that dragged Africans against their will to America, enslaved them, separated their mothers and fathers from their babies and raped and beat them and killed them. It was a Holocaust. And my story is we try to atone, not try, we do atone and repair the damage by making sure their ancestors all get to vote, which we have still yet to realize. You know, Germany has done a pretty good job in 80 years atoning for their past. Perfection almost. If you ask Jews about Germany, they've never forgotten. You know, I'm not saying all Germans are thrilled about constantly being reminded of what they're capable of, of what anybody is capable of. But the Germans, they've atoned for their past. America has not. Some of, some of what we've done we've atoned for, but we haven't really repaired the damage that we, that we inflicted upon Africans, the Chinese, Mexicans, and of course, the First Peoples. If we're not atoning for our sins, what's the point of being here? What's the point of having a country that moves forward if we can't look at the past and try to repair it. So my story of America isn't the Horatio Alger story. Did I mention he was a pedophile? That the American dream was written by a pedophile? The American dream was written by a pedophile, Horatio Alger. My story of America isn't anyone can make it here. My story isn't Bill Gates, the malignant son of a rich lawyer who dropped out of Harvard so he could hook up with some angel investors to help him buy MS DOS from someone who didn't realize what they invented. I don't celebrate that, or Steve Ballmer, his friend, this voracious bully who screams at people with this sense of white fragile entitlement because he came from Harvard. What's to celebrate? One of my stories is making sure that black people, women, Hispanics, and poor people 
all have a say in the trajectory of our government. I probably left some, some people out on purpose. I can't stand the people I left. <laughs> um, but my story of America is repairing the past and making sure that it gets better for the children of the people we persecuted. I believe everybody should be allowed to vote. I believe everybody should vote. I believe we should do what they do in Australia. I think you should be fined for not voting. You know, the individual mandate that Obama introduced for Obamacare were for until the Supreme Court ruled otherwise, you could be fined for not having health insurance. We tried it. Uh, the Supreme Court got rid of the individual mandate. There should be an individual mandate where uh, you, you want your citizenship, you have to vote. Everybody should vote if they're a citizen. And in some cities, people who aren't citizens get to vote. I'm okay with that. If you made it here, you should have a say. Even if your vote is wrong, even if you're making a mistake in your vote, your vote is just as good as mine. Do you believe that? Seriously. Do you believe that you're better than somebody who isn't as educated, wealthy, or privileged as you? Do you think their vote is the same as yours? Think about it. Because that is really the issue of our time. Do you think you're better than your neighbor? I happen to know I'm better than my neighbor in every way. Uh, my neighbor doesn't exercise, doesn't read, isn't a vegan, uh, plays loud music, smells. She uh, brings strange men back. She's too old to be living the way she's living. And yes, I pass judgment. I'm better than she is. But I still think, reluctantly, that her vote is no better than mine. Or at least I can pretend to think that. <laughs> no, but I do. I mean, listen, I don't like people. I don't. Uh, but I do believe that everybody's vote is the same. I don't think anybody is better than anybody else. I mean, you know. Marjorie Taylor Greene. She smells. Uh, I walked by her once in Washington, D.C., and uh, she smells. This country is messed up. Uh, sometimes it's run by evil people, and sometimes we do evil things to ourselves and people around the world. But there is still the promise, right? The promise of democracy, more democracy, more self-determination. And if you don't fight for that, if you don't think that is the real promise of America, then I think you believe in nothing and your vote isn't as good as mine and you should, you should be disenfranchised. If you don't think the vote, especially now, is the most important issue of our time, uh, you're, you're not seeing the larger picture. My father fought in World War II and the way he was convinced to go fight was it was for democracy. That's what they said. We're fighting for democracy, even though we didn't have democracy in the United States, right? If you were black, you couldn't vote, right? Uh, but that was the myth that they sold to get these fellows to go over there and risk their lives. That was the lie that was told to and about the greatest generation. God bless them. They packaged the war. We're fighting for democracy. Well, 
who were we bailing out, at least in Europe? France? Well, that was a colonial empire. Britain? Uh, Belgium? Uh, we weren't saving these... Uh, We weren't saving great democracies from Hitler. We were saving countries that weren't as evil to their own people as Hitler was. France, Belgium, England, they were, they were evil monsters. India, the Congo, King Leopold may have killed more people than Hitler in the Congo, Belgium. Did that to the Congo, Algeria. I'm leaving out a lot. Uh, Kenya. The, uh, their expansionism and genocide didn't extend to Europe the way Hitler's did. So we fought on their side. That's one of the reasons. Uh, but you don't need to go all the way back to World War II to find... Uh, the heroes who fought for and only for democracy, they weren't fighting for democracy. Maybe the idea of democracy, but our recent past has some real heroes. Think of Congressman John Lewis getting his skull cracked open trying to register black voters. There's a history about voting, the story I like. That's the story that I like to tell about America. Uh, we don't talk enough about people like John Lewis, the black people and the white people who died in the 60s for everyone's right to vote. People were willing to die in the 60s for your right to vote. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I would have gone down to Mississippi to register black voters. It was dangerous. People died. They got beaten up, and they died. That's, to me, the promise of America that people in this country were willing to die for. The vote. It is a promise. It hasn't been realized yet, but it is fundamental to who we are. If you look back at the past, what, 50 years, it's not, the moon, it's not the moon landing, it's not the internet, the Beatles, rap, or Barbie. For me, my, my story of America is if Joe Biden wants to get the Democratic nomination for president, he better make sure black voters approve of him. It's an amazing story of America that in 2020, Joe Biden, a deeply flawed candidate, uh, needed black Democrats or he wasn't going to get the nomination. And that's why, if you're wondering why Joe Biden moved the first primary to South Carolina in 2024, that's the reason why. Uh, it was South Carolina. I wasn't happy with what happened. I was, I'll talk about James Clyburn. Uh, but this is the way democracy is supposed to work, okay? I don't like Joe Biden. I voted for him. I'll vote for him again. But this is the way mature, patriotic Democrats fight it out. I detest Joe Biden. Uh I met him. I think he's a lightweight. I'm voting for him. I wanted Bernie, right? This is 21-year-old Bernie Sanders getting arrested in 1963 in Chicago. He was protesting segregation of public schools. They were dumping black kids into mobile vans to teach them. This is uh, Bernie Sanders. That is Bernie Sanders in 1963 getting arrested. You know, uh, I voted for Joe Biden. I'm going to vote for him again. But I got a serious problem with Joe Biden. There's Bernie 
getting arrested. Joe Biden won't stop lying about how he got arrested at civil rights protests. Doesn't stop telling this lie about how his mom was worried sick. He didn't come home that night. He got arrested. It's a lie. He lied about getting arrested in South Africa, trying to meet Mandela. That automatically disqualifies Joe Biden from ever getting the Democratic nomination. And you probably don't remember this from the 2020 presidential election, but these pictures are very personal to Bernie. And he wouldn't politicize them. He would, this was very personal and real to him. And I got a problem with South Carolina Congressman James Clyburn. Don't like him. He, uh, African-American, put the thumb on the scale in South Carolina in 2020, along with Obama and the Clintons, and they got everyone to drop out and support Joe Biden in South Carolina, even though Joe Biden hadn't won a single primary, couldn't put together a sentence back then in a debate. But they realized if we don't do something, Bernie... Bernie's going to get the nomination. So they put the thumb on the scale. They played dirty. And they they got everybody to endorse. One of the weakest candidates of the bunch, Joe Biden. And that's why uh, Biden moved the first primary to South Carolina. And uh, it's no longer New Hampshire. He, it was black Democrats in South Carolina who put Joe Biden over the top, created that momentum. Politics is dirty. I'll never forgive Congressman James Clyburn, the Obamas, Biden. I won't forgive Elizabeth Warren uh, for not saying I endorse Bernie. She could have made, made it different in South Carolina. She could have dropped out and said, I'm throwing my weight behind Bernie. Instead, she uh, accused him of saying something sexist. Uh, but I would vote for Elizabeth Warren. And I, I will vote for anybody. I'd vote for James Clyburn. But for all of them, over any of the fascists taking the stage in the GOP debate that's scheduled for this week. So I have a story of America. And again, I'd rather have Clyburn picking the next president than Rupert Murdoch. Uh, That's progress. That's hope. It's the promise of America. The promise of America is everyone gets to vote and you accept the results. You get in line and you vote for Biden and say, well, maybe we need to make a more convincing case for Bernie next time. Won't be Bernie next time. Maybe it'll be Cori Bush. But uh, that's what Democrats believe. And Republicans don't believe, which is why they wave the Confederate flag inside the Capitol on January 6. Republicans, the party of Lincoln, believe if you can't get your way at the ballot box, steal the election. And then if you can't steal the election, secede. That's what the Confederate flag was doing inside the halls of Congress on January 6. You know, I talk a lot about class consciousness and income inequality and Medicare for all. It all starts with giving everyone the vote and counting everyone's vote. With that, without that, everything else is irrelevant. It's all noise. So uh, I'm hopeful as we move forward. I think we're going to survive Trump and the authoritarian impulses threatening America. 
But as we get over Trump and DeSantis, I don't know what's going to happen to the Republican Party. I hope it splinters. After this, you have to consider what is the antidote to all of our nation's problems? More democracy. Getting more and more people to vote. In the final analysis, that's what JFK used to say, in the final analysis, it's not Medicare for all, an assault weapons ban, the climate the earned income tax credit for children. In the final analysis, it's about everyone getting to vote. Not having to wait six hours in line to vote like they do in Georgia. Not having your name scrubbed from the voting rolls so you have to invest 12 hours of your time to get it back so you can vote. Everyone gets to vote. And... Everyone's vote gets counted. I believe that. I believe that's the story of America. And I will accept the results of any election where everyone who wants to vote can vote in less than an hour and their vote gets counted. That's what I believe because I see the polls and I see who America really is. And all we need is more democracy, more people voting. If the 100 million people who could vote but don't, if they voted, all our problems would be solved. The reason we're so divided, the reason we're so angry is because we feel we aren't being heard. What is more deafening than stealing an election? In fact, it's why they stormed the Capitol on January 6th. They felt they weren't being heard. Those imbeciles were lied to by Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani. They were lied to. They believed, because they're stupid, that the election had been stolen, and they were angry because they weren't being listened to. They believed Donald Trump which is why Donald Trump and his co-conspirators are so effing evil. Americans take their votes seriously, so they storm the, the Capitol. But again, my question to you people listening who think you're so smart, who think you know way more than your neighbor, how much democracy do you really want? Do you want the Proud Boys voting? I do. Do you want Stuart Rhodes, the head of the Oath Keepers, graduate of Yale Law School, voting from prison? I do. Ask your intellectual friends that question. I believe we're in the mess we're in because too many people think they're smarter than others, and because they think they're smarter, their voice should count more. Too many intellectual bullies think they're better and therefore entitled to more than others. Some some of us think not everyone can be trusted with the vote. Are you one of those people? I know a lot of people who think that, who vote the way I do. And then they, they, they can go F themselves. They're the problem. Rudy Giuliani said on Sunday that he's planning to be arraigned this week in Georgia. Giuliani says that right after he is arrested, fingerprinted, will there be a mugshot for Rudy this week? Be interesting. He said he will immediately file to have the indictments moved to a federal courtroom. Now, I talked about this on Friday's show. It's called the Removal Statute. It was passed in 1789. It allows federal employees sued in state courts to remove the trial from the state courts and bump the trial up into a federal courtroom. This was originally, back in 1789, 
the removal statutes were passed to protect the newly sworn in president of the United States, George Washington, and his cabinet from getting sued in state courts and then having to spend weeks traveling down to, say, Georgia to defend themselves. The removal statute is going to be happening this week. At least they're going to be uh, doing evidentiary hearings this week. Mark Meadows Trump's White House chief of staff wants to move his trial in Georgia for racketeering. He wants to move it from the state court in Fulton County to the federal court for the Northern District of Georgia. So a week from today, his lawyers will go before a federal judge to make that request, and it will probably be denied. Meadows has no case, but he certainly has more of a case than Rudy Giuliani. Meadows committed his crimes as White House chief of staff. He was working for the federal government. Now, he wasn't being paid by the federal government to commit those crimes, but he was still working for the federal government. So you could make a case that these crimes were were committed while he was doing his job and therefore under the removal statutes, his trial should be bumped into a federal court. Rudy, however, has no case. Uh, he really has lost his mind. He, uh, I, I saw him talking on his live stream. Did somebody tell him that he was a federal employee? He wasn't a federal employee when he committed these crimes. In fact, he wasn't even Donald Trump's employee because nobody was paying him. He got no money to do what he was doing. He can't claim that he was working for the federal government. He can't even claim he was working for the Republican Party when his crimes were committed. He was doing it in Georgia and around the country for free because he's a desperate alcoholic who needs psychiatric help. But even more importantly about Rudy Giuliani, Rudy can't send his lawyers into a federal courtroom and request that his trial in Georgia be removed from the state and bumped up into a federal courtroom for one simple reason. He can't afford a lawyer. Rudy Giuliani is broke, and he deserves to be broke. He deserves everything that's happening to him, and then some. Rudy has a radio show on WABC in New York. And over the weekend, somebody called and said, how are you going to mount your defense? And Rudy said he is going to present scientific evidence of voter fraud in Georgia. Wow. Scientific evidence. Will it be space age evidence as well, Rudy? You know, the kind of evidence the astronauts drink? Space age evidence. Well, let's turn to the indictment in Miami, where Donald Trump faces criminal charges of mishandling classified documents and then covering up the crime. It's more important uh, than I think. Uh, the, I think the Georgia trial is more fun. I think uh, Jack Smith's trial in Washington, D.C. for election interference is more fun But I suspect this is what Chris Christie is going to be hammering the other candidates about during this week's big debate on Fox News. It's going to be all about the mishandling of classified documents. That's my prediction. Less about January 6th, more about the mishandling of classified documents. That's, I predict, is going to be Chris Christie's gambit. Because the people who watch Fox News and most Republicans don't give a damn about January 6th. They're glad it happened. That's not to say Chris Christie won't be attacking the other candidates for being so chicken shit when it comes to criticizing Donald Trump for the way he incited an insurrection. Here is an example of Chris Christie in New Hampshire over the weekend. Here is a sample of what you can expect at the debate. This is him going after Ron DeSantis. 
it's pretty, pretty incriminating. If he thinks he's going to get on the stage to defend Donald Trump on Wednesday night, then he should do Donald Trump a favor and do our party a favor. Come back to Tallahassee, endorse that Donald is the Trump, wrong get the clip. hell out of the race. I'm sorry. That is the wrong clip. That was him talking about Juarez. Suarez. Did I play you the wrong clip? I had a really good clip of Chris Christie. And that's a good one. Hang on. Uh, damn it. Oh, here it is. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Here's Chris Christie going after Ron DeSantis. When he got asked up in New Hampshire by a 15-year-old about his point of view on the January 6th riot, he said, well, I wasn't in Washington that day, so I don't know as much about it. Well, man, I wasn't in Washington either. Okay? But I have a TV set, and I saw what was going on, and I got an opinion about it. Hmm. Was he doing Chris Rock there for a second? Um, anyway, he's right, what he just said. But most people who watch Fox News don't care about January 6th. The classified documents case, however, is going to be a little harder for the candidates to stand with Donald Trump over. Uh, especially since Bill Barr, the former attorney general, is on Fox News as a paid contributor all the time, specifically hammering Donald Trump on the classified documents. And this is tough. You can't really defend. See, I don't think the classified documents are particularly important, but Republicans are big on national security. They're big on the military. And it's going to be really hard to claim the military is now a part of the deep, dark state, that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, drew up this war plan with Iran and then gave it to Trump as part of a setup. I mean, I guess if you're Marjorie Taylor Greene and QAnon, you can say that. But it's going to be really hard to defend the mishandling of these classified documents. If you want to be commander in chief and you're, you know, this is about daddy or mommy taking care of frightened Republicans. National security is a top priority and you, you cannot trivialize the mishandling of classified documents if you're a Republican. So I think that's going to be Chris Christie's gambit. I think he's going to be talking about Mar-a-Lago. Uh, that, among registered Republicans who vote in the primaries, I think it makes, doesn't make Trump look bad, it makes the other candidates look bad defending that behavior. So Chris Christie will hammer them, the can other candidates, uh, more on that trial in Miami than the ones on in election interference on January 6th. Uh, it's going to be an interesting debate, but there are too many people now on, on the stage, too many people qualified, uh, too many people. Too many people. Going back to the classified documents, Mark Meadows is making life difficult for Donald Trump, especially over the weekend. ABC News reports that he was, you know, he was Trump's last chief of staff, and Meadows has no recollection of Trump ever declassifying any of the documents that Trump brought back with him to Mar-a-Lago. There are now reports that Mark Meadows has written, has rewritten his autobiography, which hasn't come out yet, and he took out the introduction from the first draft in which he describes Donald Trump leaving classified war plans with Iran, the infamous classified war plans with Iran. He left them out on his couch in the Bedminster Country Club for everyone to see. That was in the first draft According to ABC News, that was in the first draft of Mark Meadows' autobiography, and it has now been taken out. MSNBC legal analyst over the weekend, Neil Katyal, suggested 
that Mark Meadows could now be folded into the Miami case because he's participating in a cover-up for Donald Trump. When asked about this on Sunday, former Vice President Mike Pence said he did not recall uh, any broad-based effort on Donald Trump's part to declassify documents in bulk to justify the sheer number of classified documents found in Mar-a-Lago. You know, Trump said he waved his hands over all these documents and said, Illimini, Chilibini, all these documents are declassified. And Mike Pence says he does not recall Donald Trump uh, doing that. Doesn't look good. You know, it's a slam dunk. The classified documents case in Miami is a slam dunk. It's kind of like getting Al Capone for taxes in Miami, by the way. Al Capone was also in Florida when he got arrested for, for his taxes. It's not the worst crime that Donald Trump committed, but uh, I quite frankly think it pales compared to January 6th. But if he can get Al Capone on taxes, lock him up. Although I don't think they're going to lock Trump up for, mis- for violating the Espionage Act. This is all he's charged with violating the Espionage Act. I don't think he gets locked up for this. But if you recall, Trump is caught on tape saying of the Iran war plans that the documents are still classified. Do you remember this? I, I could play the tape again. He... Uh, He added on the tape that he could have declassified them, but he didn't. And that establishes criminal intent. He knew the documents were still classified. It's on tape. And that he he knew it was against the law to show the, the war plans to anyone, but he did it anyway. That's criminal intent. He may not have known that he was violating the Espionage Act, But he knew he was breaking the law. You can hear him on tape laughing about it. Preet Bharaha, a former uh, U.S. attorney, told ABC News over the weekend that he doesn't think former chief of staff Mark Meadows has flipped. He doesn't think Mark Meadows is cooperating with the special counsel Jack Smith in any way. Well, he would know better than I would. But uh, I don't know. Something doesn't feel right. I think Mark Meadows is cooperating with Jack Smith uh, in, in Miami on the mishandling of classified documents. Uh, Meadows was indicted last Monday, remember, by the Fulton County District Attorney, Fonnie Willis, for racketeering and trying to interfere with the 2020 presidential election results in Georgia. Yet, Mark Meadows was not named as a co-conspirator in special counsel Jack Smith's August 1st indictment of Donald Trump for many of the same crimes he was indicted for last Monday in Georgia. So Meadows has remained silent, and that's one of the sure tells that he's cooperating with somebody, right? If you flipped... You don't, you, you don't talk to anybody. Apparently, he didn't cooperate with Fonnie Willis in Georgia because he just got indicted by her. Why wasn't he named as a co-conspirator in Jack Smith's indictment for election interference up in Washington? We know that Mark Meadows was in on every crime Trump committed. Mark Meadows arranged all the meetings. He sat in on them. You could hear him lying to Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, on that infamous phone call. Why wasn't he named in Washington, D.C. as a co-conspirator? We know Rudy, Kenneth Cheesebro, John Eastman, Sidney Powell, and Jeffrey Clark were listed as co-conspirators. How can Mark Meadows not be listed as a co-conspirator 
in the federal indictments for election interference. How is that possible? Any crimes Donald Trump committed, his chief of staff, Mark Meadows, aided and abetted. How is it possible that he's not a co-conspirator? So I think Mark Meadows flipped, but and he flipped for Jack Smith, the special counsel. I think he flipped, but not for the election interference prosecution in Washington, D.C. I don't, I'm just gaming this. I think, I suspect Mark Meadows flipped on the Miami case. That was Jack Smith's first indictment, and he wants it to be a slam dunk. And everyone agrees it's a slam dunk. Everybody says, you know, the, the, the indictments that came down August 1st, that, that's going to be tough, the election. Inter- but everybody, everybody says that, Mar- uh, that Jack Smith has a slam dunk on the mishandling of classified documents. Louisiana Republican Senator Bill Cassidy was on CNN's State of the Union Sunday. He said Trump is a Republican from Louisiana, Bill Cassidy, said Trump should drop out of the race precisely because of the classified documents case. He said it is obviously a slam dunk. This is why I think you're going to be hearing more about the classified documents during the debate than you will about the election interference. This is something the Republicans run on, right? National security. Uh, They can't softball Trump's crimes when it comes to net, showing people classified documents. So I suspect Mark Meadows made a deal and uh, he still gets indicted in uh, Georgia by Fawny Willis, but the feds, I think he uh, I think he made a deal with Jack Smith. Uh Well, I'm going to wrap it up. Ron DeSantis is coming under fire for comments made during an interview where he referred to Donald Trump's cult of personality, turning his supporters into, quote, listless vessels. Right. Ron DeSantis said the people who vote for Trump are listless vessels and conservatives are now comparing his remark to Hillary referring to Trump's supporters in 2016 as a basket of deplorables. Remember that? The Trump campaign says DeSantis owes an apology to Trump and his listless vessels. But, you know, what do you think? Listless vessels or a basket of deplorables? I'm going to go with Hillary. These people... uh, are deplorable. They, they weren't so listless on January 6th. They were more deplorable than listless. So with the debate this week on Fox, DeSantis has the most to lose since he is currently perceived as Trump's main challenger. And since only Chris Christie is willing to attack Trump, DeSantis will end up being everybody else's target, Right. You go after the front runner, unless it's Trump, so you go after the guy who's perceived to be in second place. So it's going to be Ron DeSantis' turn in the barrel. The Washington Post has gotten its hands on a leaked document over the weekend showing how DeSantis grants access to high-powered lobbyists in exchange for donations. In essence, all the Florida governor's leisure activities are up for bid, including his favorite pastime, playing golf. Actually, that's his second favorite. His all-time, Ron DeSantis' all-time favorite pastime is pleasuring himself while inmates at Gitmo are force-fed nutrients through their rectums. 90% of that previous sentence is true. Showtime canceled the Vice documentary about what Ron DeSantis did at Gitmo when he was a JAG officer. We know he told 
the CIA, yes, force feeding inmates through their rectum is uh, legal. It's not. And he laughed. There's a whole documentary that Showtime is not running. Anyway, this leaked memo proposes that DeSantis can raise $1 million for the super PAC by targeting Florida's fourth 40, 40 wealthiest Republicans, offering them literally pay to play. You donate, you get to play golf with DeSantis or have a meal with DeSantis and watch him eat pudding with his fingers. Or if you pay extra, he'll eat the pudding with his toes. According to the leaked memo, a round of golf with DeSantis cost $25,000. The memo reveals that soliciting these donations uh, is Ron DeSantis. He's been picking up the phone, calling lobbyists, calling people, hey, play golf with me for $25,000. He's draining the swamp. DeSantis is the father of three small children. He's in his mid-40s. He's got three small children, all under the age of 13. And he will never get this time back with his kids. He will never get it back. But he can't help himself. He's ambitious. Madison, Mason, and Mamie, those are his three kids, all under the age of 13. Madison, Mason, and Mamie, if he has a fourth kid, I guess the only name left that begins with an M would be Moron. Uh, he'll never get that time back with his kids. His wife is a recent breast cancer survivor. He will never get this time back with his wife and his kids. So you want to talk family values, Ron DeSantis? Years are reprehensible to put your small kids through this. You have zero family values. Three small children, your wife's a breast cancer survivor, and you can't help yourself. You have to run for president. Why don't you drop out and spend time with your kids? Wait 10 years when you're in your 50s before you put your petty ambitions above your kids. Your values suck. You truly are corrupt. And your kids, you know, I talk about ancestral guilt. Your kids are going to pay a price. Well, maybe they're better off with you out on the campaign trail, not around them. You know what? I stand corrected. You're doing them a favor, you fascist prick. Meanwhile, DeSantis and his Central Florida Tourism Oversight District Board is being sued by Disney for breach of contract, as well as violating the company's constitutional rights to freedom of speech. After DeSantis targeted Disney when it came out against last year's Don't Say Gay bill. Right? He's all about the First Amendment. But if you criticize him, I go after you. Right? Uh, he removed Disney's special status as a self-governing entity in Orlando because Disney exercised its First Amendment right and came out against the Don't Say Gay bill, right? But, you know, these Republicans, it's all about freedom of speech, to use the N-word and not get canceled, right? To use the C-word and not get canceled. But, you know, more banned books in Florida, thanks to Ron DeSantis... Actually, Texas has more banned books. These people don't give a crap about the First Amendment. Uh, but DeSantis is running scared. He's afraid of Disney. He told CNBC he has put it all behind him and has moved on, but Disney won't let it drop. They're suing him and the state of Florida. And in May, Disney canceled building a $1 billion campus in Florida for employees citing concerns over DeSantis's anti-LGBTQ laws. And by the way, F. Robert Iger, the chairman of Disney, and F. Disney. Uh, until they come to the bargaining table and iron out a contract with the writers and the actors, F. 
Disney. F all of them. F DeSantis, F Robert Iger, F all of them. Reuters reports that while the Heritage Foundation, which is funded by fossil fuel corporations, the Heritage Foundation is consulting all the Republican candidates, including Trump, but the ultra-right-wing extremist organization, the Heritage Foundation, seems to be favoring Ron DeSantis. They have an extra-close relationship with Ron DeSantis. He talks with the leaders of the ultra-right-wing extremist organization, the Heritage Foundation, seven days a week, according to Reuters. The Heritage Foundation, an ultra-far-right-wing extremist organization, the Heritage Foundation was founded in 1973 with oil money as well as beer money. Uh, It was founded in 1973. Uh, They read the Powell Memo and they founded the Heritage Foundation. A lot of the money came from the beer magnate, Joseph Coors, who had a storied history of union busting and workplace discrimination. Joseph Coors did, as does the the beer company, which I think, uh, I, I think in Bobby Kennedy's book, Bobby Kennedy Jr.'s book that he wrote, you know, like 15 years ago, I think they used to have KKK meetings uh, outside the factory in Colorado. It's in Bobby Kennedy's book when his uh, brain was functioning properly. Uh, Joseph Coors, who helped found the Heritage Foundation, according to his son, ran out on his mom for a younger woman. Joseph Coors was described as a sinner, an adulterer, and was generally regarded as anti-gay, racist, and sexist. He put the seed money. He was one of the original founders of the Heritage Foundation. Joseph Kors' brother, Bill Kors, during a speech in 1984 before an organization of black Denver businessmen, said they should be grateful for slavery because America did their ancestors a favor by dragging them to this great country in chains. That's who the uh, Heritage Foundation is. They pick our judges along with the Federalist Society. Now, let me say something about institutions and parties and people. They, They change and often do. And when it comes to the Heritage Foundation or the GOP, they certainly have changed. They've gotten worse. What their donors once said behind closed doors is now said out in the open, often brandishing an AR-15. And their honesty about who they are and what they stand for has given license to the dumbest people in America to act out. So never forget, while watching the debate this week on Fox News, the Republican Party cannot change. It cannot change. Not yet. Not yet. It changed. Any change you're going to see, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. It cannot change for the better. It can only change for the worse. The Republican Party will pretend it's opening doors to women, blacks, non-Christians like Vivek Ramaswamy or women of color like Nikki Haley who converted to Christianity unlike Vivek Ramaswamy. But this party is controlled by white male billionaires who use the evangelical movement to attack the 99%. They they use the evangelical movement as foot soldiers to demonize the LGBTQ women and anyone who isn't white or Christian. They use uh, crazy Christians to divide and conquer 
the 99% and make them stupid so nobody realizes who's really screwing them over. That's not going to change. It's only going to get worse. The Republican Party is only going to get worse. Now, there are going to be a lot of issues discussed during the debate. For example, Ukraine. Now, Republicans have a problem because Republicans behind closed doors are on the side of Russia because Putin is a white Christian who is anti-women and anti-LGBTQ. He's an authoritarian. He's easy to do business with. In fact, they get a lot of money from him. Whereas Ukraine is run by a Jew, Zelensky. Ukraine is more pluralistic. I know a lot of my listeners don't agree with me, but it is slightly more pluralistic. Republicans take their money from Russian oligarchs. So they have a problem. They have a serious problem when it comes to Ukraine because they want Putin to win in Ukraine, but the Republicans are pro-war. They are pro-weapons industry, and the weapons industry is siding with Ukraine. So the Republicans going into this week's debate have two competing forces pulling at them in separate directions. They get money from Russian oligarchs. They're on the side of Putin because they agree with him. But they also are pulled in the opposite direction by the military-industrial complex. Right? They want... They take money from Boeing and Raytheon... So how do you thread the needle? How do they square this difference? Racism. You turn to racism. Okay. I saw it two weeks ago when Chris Christie said he supports arming Ukraine because this is not a war against Russia. It's a war against China. Racism. See how this works? Chinese, not white. This is how racism is used to market Republican policy. See, when Russia invaded Ukraine, everyone said, oh dear, these people look just like us. I couldn't believe the racism that came out of people's mouths. This is, uh, they would say, this is very upsetting. Look at the Ukrainian refugees. They look like us. I mean, this is what you heard on MSNBC and CNN, not Fox News. Well, nobody said, uh, well, you know, the Syrian refugees also looked just like us. Depends on what the definition of us is. When the Russian soldiers were seen dying... They were white. It was confusing. And you heard people saying, my God, they look like us. People who look like us are fighting other people who look like us. I don't understand this. Usually we, we root against people of color. You know, it's no coincidence that Prescott Bush's son went off and fought in the Pacific against the Japanese because it didn't sit well with Prescott having his son fighting Germans, especially since they're the same color as Prescott's son was, Prescott Bush, George Herbert Walker Bush. And Prescott was probably still doing business with Hitler. Uh, so... Racism is how the Republicans sell things. Now, I don't think these Republicans are like fire-breathing racists. I don't think they wake up and go, God, I hate people of color. I hate gays and Jews. I don't think they... I think you can sell them things subliminally through bigotry and racism. I think some of them <laughs> do wake up every morning and are filled with nothing but hatred and bigotry. But I think the people at Fox News, the people who watch Fox News, the people who vote for Trump, they don't think they're bigots. 
but you can use, you know how sex sells, even though everybody isn't always thinking about sex? Bigotry in the Republican Party also sells, even though everybody isn't thinking how much they hate other groups of people. Bigotry is what is how you sell things to Republican voters. And Nikki Haley has picked up on Chris Christie's talking point. Be prepared for this during the debate this week. She says we must support Ukraine, not to beat Russia, to beat the Chinese, right? Because the Chinese look different. Uh, By the way, so does uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, and so does Nikki Haley, and uh, so does... uh, Tim Scott, who's also running, and they will find out soon enough just how uh, loved they are in the Republican Party for their color. But they're going to demonize the Chinese when it comes to Ukraine. They will stand up for the military-industrial complex in Ukraine. They won't stand up for Ukraine. They will stand... We have to fight the Chinese. Now, last time I checked, China was trying to broker a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine, but America wasn't interested. Uh, Republicans figured it out. This is about fighting China. They're not white, so they're the enema. An enema. What time is it? They're the enemy. So... We're fighting the Chinese, not the Russians in Ukraine. We're fighting the Russians. The same way we fought the Russians in Vietnam and Korea. That's how Vietnam and Korea were packaged, through racism. Right? We were fighting Russia, but better we should kill Asians in a proxy war than go to war with people who look like us, Russia. Better we should kill Asians, but close our eyes and imagine we're killing Russians than to actually kill Russians. How many millions of Vietnamese died? How many Laotians, how many millions of Laotians died? How many Laotians were killed by the CIA? Those bombs are still going off in Laos. How many millions died in Cambodia because we had to fight the Russians in a proxy war? We had to kill Asians because you can't kill white people. Better we kill Asians in a proxy war than go to war with people who look like us. Race is a great way to market wars overseas. And it's a great way to market war domestically against the 99%. Race is how the billionaire class wages war against the rest of us. Now, per capita, white people are more likely to need and be on food stamps than people of color. Right? Doesn't matter. Reagan, whose own son said he's a racist. Uh, There's a Showtime documentary about the Reagans. See the interview with Ron Jr. He said, my father was a racist. Reagan took food stamps and welfare and made those programs synonymous with black people. Why did he do that? Well, he wanted to cut those benefits. So why did he make it synonymous with black people? Because Reagan knew white people are stupid, especially down south. And he knew that white people down south didn't realize how dependent they were on the government. He knew and he helped brainwash these people into thinking, no, it's black people who are gaming the system. 
It's black people who are on welfare. It's black people on food stamps. He coined the term welfare queen. And that was race baiting, was a dog whistle. Welfare queen was this imaginary black woman who would show up claiming she had 40 kids and she drove a Cadillac and had a fur coat. It was pretty detestable. Not pretty detestable. It was detestable. Uh, But that's how he convinced stupid white voters that it's black people who are gaming the system. It's also how guns are sold in this country, right? If you look at the advertising, they use sex to sell guns and racism. Uh, You better get a gun. Black people are coming for your stuff. That's how the NRA convinces you to buy guns. Tommy Tuberville, Senator Tommy Tuberville, literally said that last year in Nevada while he was campaigning for Adam Laxalt, the Republican who was running for Senate. And when Nevada gets around to the fake elector scheme, Adam Laxalt has a lot of explaining to do. He's the bastard son of Pete Domenici. Uh, I've gone over this. Adam Laxalt is the bastard son of Republican Pete Domenici. Uh, Senator Paul Laxalt of Nevada had a daughter who became a lobbyist who had an extramarital affair with Republican Senator Pete Domenici. And when Pete Domenici wasn't busy traveling around the country talking about good Christian values and being against same-sex marriage and how important the family was, he was banging Pete Domenici's daughter, and he got her pregnant. And uh, Adam Laxalt came out, the bastard Adam Laxalt. People say, don't call him a bastard. Well, there are other words I could use. Anyway, Tommy Tuberville was busy campaigning in Nevada last year for the bastard Adam Laxalt. And this is what Tommy Tuberville said of Democrats. Quote, they're not soft on crime. They're pro-crime. They want crime. They want crime because they want to take over what you got. They want to control what you have. They want reparations because they think the people that do the crime are owed that. He was worked up. You should Google on YouTube or whatever and watch the speech. He got worked up, you know. He was going off script, and he accidentally said what he really thought. They want reparations because they think the people that do the crime are owed that. That's Senator Tommy Tuberville, who said of the white nationalists serving in the military this year. When asked, are you concerned about white nationalists serving in the military? He said, well, you call them white nationalists. I call them Americans. Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville calling black people criminals, get a gun, go buy a gun. So all these stupid white people down south... They buy guns. And what do these stupid people, these stupid white people down south do with these guns? The same exact thing they do by electing people like Tommy Tuberville who cut their food stamps and welfare. They end up shooting themselves. Right? Because they're stupid and easily manipulated. Nobody ever stopped a black man from robbing them. Nobody ever got a gun and stopped a black man. They've uh, killed black men who weren't robbing them, but nobody ever stopped a crime with a gun. That's a fact. And I've said that for years, 
And people who are NRA members send me anecdotal stories, and then you dig down and you realize, no, nah, that's you're not you don't know how to read. Nobody ever stopped a home invasion with a gun. Nobody stops a crime with a gun. It doesn't matter. Uh, you buy guns. Uh, your guns are sold to you through bigotry, racism, and sex, right? You're impotent. You know, you can't get laid. This will go off instead. Uh, so white people need welfare and food stamps. They don't know that. They don't know uh, that, but their brains are so easy, easily manipulated. They, uh, they believe that black people, when it comes to food stamps, are gaming the system. $4 a day, that's what food stamps are. Now, I talked about Chris Christie's obesity, and I talked about half of Americans being obese and how Chris Christie is a Republican and thinks, you know, food stamps are bad. Well, <clears throat> this week, you're going to be hearing this discussion about food stamps because there's this inbred imbeciles Song. Uh, his name is Oliver Anthony. And this piece of work has a song that's gone viral. It's called Rich Men North of Richmond. Rich Men North of Richmond. There no, apparently there are no rich men south of Richmond. Hmm. Uh, he sings about the people north of Richmond keeping the poor people down. He talks about how the people north of Richmond are taxing poor people. Mm, no, your, your hillbillies actually aren't being taxed. They're getting an earned income tax credit. It's welfare by another name. Nobody's taxing the people you're singing about, you effing idiot. You racist imbecile. You make the banjo player from Deliverance look like Rock Hudson. And uh, the hillbillies get an earned income tax credit. That's welfare by another name. And, you know, the Democrats, if you knew how to read Oliver Anthony, if you knew how to read, you would know that the Democrats try to make the earned income tax credit for children, $300 a month, permanent, but uh, the Republicans voted against that. When Biden took office at the height of COVID, every family suddenly that was living at or below the poverty line was getting an extra $300 a month per child. It brought child poverty down to record lows, Oliver Anthony, you douchebag, you stupid, dangerous douchebag, you racist douchebag. The Democrats brought childhood poverty down to record lows with an earned income tax credit for each child at $300 a month. And then the Republicans, they, they filibustered the extension. It expired at the end of 2022. And then the Republicans got control of the House, and it was impossible to renew this year the earned income tax credit, giving $300 to every child. The uh, Republicans said, no, 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 no. You give $300 to each child living at or below the poverty line, it incentivizes their parents not to go look for work. 
you effing moron. Oliver Anthony. You simpleton. You brain-dead moron. You stupid idiot. You worthless piece of excrement with your stupid racist song that empowers ignorance. And uh, I noticed that you don't mention in your song that it was the Republicans, Oliver Anthony, white male Republicans this year who held up the raising of the debt ceiling. It was Kevin McCarthy, the white racist uh, Speaker of the House, who insisted that he would only vote to raise the debt ceiling if uh, we took food stamps away from able-bodied Americans with no children. They brought back the work requirement. Uh, They cut food stamps. But this imbecile, Oliver Anthony, who's never read a book in his life, obviously, or is reading the wrong books, surrounded by morons, is singing about poor people gaming the food stamp system. Yeah, gaming the food... He's singing about people ripping off taxpayers, $4 a day, gaming the food system. He's got this song that all the dumb, should we call them hillbillies? Uh, This is what tricks stupid people into shooting themselves, buying guns or buying supply-side economics. This is how stupid white people in the South get tricked into destroying their lives and voting for Republicans. They think this song is an anthem about ordinary working folk getting victimized by the people north of Richmond. And then he sings about food stamps for fat people, just like Woody Guthrie, right? Regular folk singer, right? Literally a folk song attacking poor people for collecting food stamps. He doesn't think fat people should be getting food stamps. Fat people are gaming the system. Uh, So he says, I wish politicians would look out for minors and not just miners on an island somewhere. So he's talking about the, uh, what is it? How many people are miners? What are there, like 14,000 people who work as miners in West Virginia? That's it. Like nobody's a miner anymore. The jobs don't exist. Get over it. Uh, And miners don't want to be miners. And... It's the the coal is killing us, right? But I get it. And not just miners on an island somewhere. So that must be Pedo Island, right? Jeffrey Epstein. Lord, we got folks in the street, ain't got nothing to eat. And the obese milk and welfare. Wow. The obese are milk and welfare. Well, God, if you're five foot, this is bringing God into this. I got news for you. Uh, It ain't Jesus who agrees with you, you you moron. If you're talking to Jesus, uh, God, if you're five foot three and you're 300 pounds, taxes ought not to pay for your bag of fudge rounds. So he's going after five foot three. Americans who weigh 300 pounds and says, God, taxes ought not to pay for their bags of fudge rounds. Because this damn country keeps on kicking them down. So the guys north of Richmond are the wealthy elitists, right? But we got to get the five foot three, 300 pound people 
off food stamps because they're buying bags of fudge rounds. They're they're the they're the bad people. You're uh, an imbecile. You're an imbecile. You know, uh, instead of attacking poor people for getting ad- addicted to fat, sugar, and salt, uh, this is going to be an issue. Food stamps for fat people. This is going to be an issue. This is how they're going to demonize. They, you want to demonize poor people. The new thing about obesity, we have half this country is obese. You're going to be hearing... Why are fat people on food stamps? And nobody's going to uh, speak up and say, well, you know, we kind of got them addicted to fat, sugar, and salt. And nobody's going to go after the junk food companies. Nobody's going to say, hey, why don't we tax the junk food companies, the fast food companies, the same way we tax cigarettes? How about urging Congress to pass a farm bill that doesn't favor big ag? It doesn't favor the mass producers of sugar, salt, and fat, and cheese. How about recognizing that fast food and junk food costs us trillions a year in medical expenses and lost work? No, it's the five foot three, 300 pound person on food stamps getting $4 a day and buying fudge with it. Can't have a a conversation in this country about sugar, salt, and fat giving us diabetes, obesity, cancer, heart disease, and rotting our teeth. And there's no Medicare for all or no Medicare that covers dental, right? Can't sing a song about that, you prick, you limp prick. How about maybe singing a song tackling food deserts? You know, where working people and poor people don't have the freedom to make a choice of fresh vegetables and fruits over processed junk food. You know, if all you put in front of a starving man is his own shit, he'll eat his own shit. Why are Coke machines and snack machines in public schools? Why do school cafeterias serve pizza and macaroni and cheese and desserts? And chocolate milk. We've got kids, their brains are growing. They need vitamins and proteins, not junk food. Why don't you sing a song about that? Those are the men north of Richmond who are screwing the idiots listening to your song. But instead, blame the welfare cheats, gaming the system, trying to squeeze $4 a day in food stamps. Trying to squeeze a meal out of $4 a day in food stamps, you brain-addled hayseed. I am so glad I don't have to worry about what these morons think. I don't care what they think. I don't. Give everybody the vote. Uh, But I don't care what these morons think, because they're morons. I'm David Feldman, reminding you to remind... Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, that she's a moron. Her mailing address sent her a postcard. It only cost 50 cents, less than 50 cents, to remind Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene that she's a moron. Her address is Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, 403 Cannon Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Send her a postcard and do what I told you to do earlier in the show. Don't try to be smart. They don't care. Just tell her you're stupid and she's stupid and it'll register. I'm David Feldman reminding you to stay strong and protect the weak. we got a lot of work to do this week. Thank you for listening. Thank you to the mods who keep the chat room civil Please like this video so it ends up in your feed. Please subscribe to my channel. Please subscribe to my newsletter, which I'm going to start up after Labor Day. And uh, we're going to start up office hours after Labor Day as well. 
Thank you, everybody.